They are dying. Let them die. News grants favor and brings vengeance. We cry out to you this day for the oppressed, the captive, and the brokenhearted. For evil, sin, and disaster assail us from all sides across the land. People suffer left and right. Death hangs in the air. Yet, you are our strength and our fortress. We are not forgotten. Yes, God still reigns in heaven. You ride across the heavens to our aid with majestic splendor. You bring the light of a thousand suns to bear, dispelling the deepest dark. In you, we wait, for you are our hope. O oh Lord, you are our Redeemer, and through you we shall be saved. Amen. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Number 170, the king of love, my shepherd is. Let us rise.
hatred. Hatred. I see your hatred of the Daleks, and it is good. No, no, no. no you must see more than that. There must be more than that. reading from the scriptures in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double, and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot. Therefore, they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For the Lord loved justice. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. To offer Klingons safe haven within Federation space is suicide. Klingons would become the alien trash of the galaxy. And if we dismantle the fleet, we'd be defenseless before an aggressive species with a foothold on our territory. The opportunity here is to bring them to their needs. Then we'll be in a far better position to dictate terms. But you know how I feel about this. They're animals, Jim. There is an historic opportunity here. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. They are dying. Let them die. I've never trusted Klingons. And I never will. I can never forgive them for the death of my boy. It seems to me our mission to escort the Chancellor of the Klingon High Council to a peace Problematic at best. I offer a toast. The undiscovered country. The future. I tried to tell you, but you would not listen. Neither of us was hearing very well that night, Lieutenant. There were things I tried to tell you about having faith. You have betrayed the Federation. All of you. And what do you think you've been doing? Saving Starfleet. Klingons cannot be trusted. Sir, you said so yourself. They killed your son. Did you not wish Gorkon dead? Let them die, you said. Did I misinterpret you? And you were right. They conspired with us to assassinate their own chancellor. How trustworthy can they be? Klingons and 
Federation members conspiring together. Who is us? Everyone who stands to lose from peace. You said it yourself, it was logical. Peace is worth a few personal risks. You're a great one for logic. I'm a great one for rushing in where angels fear to tread. We're both extremists. Reality is probably somewhere in between. I couldn't get past the death of my son. I was prejudiced by her accomplishments as a Balkan. Gorkin had to die before I understood how prejudiced I was. What's happened? What's the meaning of all of this? It's about the future, Madam Chancellor. Some people think the future means the end of history. Well, we haven't run out of history quite yet. Your father called the future the undiscovered country. People can be very frightened of change. You've restored my father's faith. And you've restored my son's. Course heading, Captain. Second start of the ride. And straight on till morning. Let them die. With these harsh words, the captain of the Enterprise, James Kirk, responds to the empath empathetic plea of his most trusted friend, the Vulcan Spock. The vitriol from this leader of the Federation may seem somewhat unexpected, but it certainly fits within the larger narrative of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. The Klingons, a warrior species and the longtime nemesis for the United Federation of Planets, are now holding out an olive branch of peace. A major disaster has crippled their ability to sustain their culture, their economic system is collapsing, and it may even result in their extinction. Some, like Admiral Cartwright, see this as an opportunity to eliminate the Vulcan threat, or at least to exert the Federation's power over their foes, to operate from the position of privilege and superiority. Kirk himself has engaged in multiple battles against the Klingons over the years of service as a Starfleet captain. And most pointedly in the film Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, the Klingon crew of one of their birds of prey murders Kirk's son, David, an action that Kirk cannot and will not forgive. Now it is Kirk himself and the Enterprise crew who are being ordered to escort the Klingon Chancellor Gorkon to a peace conference with the intention of bringing the Klingons into the Federation and ending more than a century of hostility between the two enemies in the Star Trek timeline. En route, Gorkon is assassinated by elements within both the Klingon Empire and the Federation who have joined together to resist this possibility for a different future with all the risks and uncertainty that it holds. They fear the unknown, what it might mean, how their privileged status may be lost, what else they might lose, how things might be different, because it will be different. Many will lose much as a result of peace. As Kirk later states, somewhat obviously but explicitly, people can be very frightened of change. The known present, the maintenance of the status quo, is much safer, much more familiar, much more certain, much easier, and much too unjust. Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, essentially functions as the backstory, explaining why on the television series Star Trek The Next Generation, there's a Klingon, Lieutenant Worf, serving as an officer in Starfleet and on the bridge of the Enterprise itself. That television series began its seven season run in 1987, with Klingons having joined the Federation since the events of the original series. Undiscovered Country provides the details for such a dramatic change in Klingon Federation relations. During the Next Generation era, this final movie with the original series crew recounting their culminating heroic mission was released in 1991. As with other Star Trek series, the cultural context for its storyline is important. 
The original series, of course, aired from 1966 to 1969 in the midst of the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement. Many of its episodes deal directly with issues of war, specifically nuclear war, democracy, totalitarianism, and racism, including a very controversial scene at the time in one episode that is commonly credited as the first televised interracial kiss. Star Trek also directly addressed the inclusion of the outsider, the marginalized, and even the enemy. It is no accident that among the bridge officers on the Enterprise in its 1960s version were a Japanese man, a Russian man, and an African-American woman. This diversity among the Enterprise crew who work together for the greater good is celebrated. Continuing through its other incarnations of TV series and films, Star Trek has made many issues of social justice, inclusion, and respect for different worldviews, primary values in its universe. So this brings us to 1991 and the release of Star Trek VI. The Berlin Wall had been torn down only two years earlier. Perestroika and Glasnost were alive and well, and an improved relationship between Russia and the U.S. showed great promise. How should the good guys, you know, us, respond to the enemy, the hated villain, the evil empire, now that there seems to be a chance for peace? In this setting, it's quite easy to see Star Trek VI functioning as a parallel or perhaps even an allegory in which the Klingons represent the Russians and the Federation is the U.S. What undiscovered country, what possible future might be possible for the world at, the mo at that moment in 1991? Who would be willing to take the risk, that personal risk mentioned by Kirk, for the possibility of change, for the possibility of peace? Who would need to overcome their own fear to name and determine to move beyond their own prejudice about whether a human, a Vulcan, or an American? And what about now in 2017? These same questions about fear, prejudice, and personal responsibility remain relevant in the midst of our turbulent time with so much possibility, so much injustice, so much hatred, and so much fear. In the film, Chancellor Gorkin calls the future the undiscovered country, lifting the phrase from Shakespeare's Hamlet. In the context of the Bard's play, the undiscovered country is death, or what happens after death, as it is unknown. But here the term undiscovered country gets recast as a metaphor for the unknown future to what might be possible, but without certainty. Kirk reiterates this view of the future as an undiscovered country, now being open to change and taking action, taking personal risk to see that such a future may indeed be realized. Now to my ears, uh, they're not Vulcan ears, but to my ears, this sounds like the concept of utopia, to a good place that is no place, but towards which humanity is constantly drawn. Oscar Wilde's statement from 1891 is often cited by those who work on utopias and utopian thinking, quote, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even looking at, for it leaves out the country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. I believe Wilde is correct. Utopia is always the goal, but never achieved. When we think we have arrived at the good place, our impulse is to something better, something grander, something beyond, something that stretches our imagination. It finds an echo for me in the Apostle Paul's words, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love God. Our hope is that one day we will experience this type of existence and that this utopia will be our reality. Now, whatever the nature of our eschatological hope, humanity's present reflects the tension between dystopia and utopia, between our failures and our successes, between injustice and justice. We oppress, we hate, we are prejudiced, we marginalize, and we exploit. We create dystopia, but we also desire utopia. And of course, we all do not define utopia in the same way, a goal towards which we should all be striving and reaching out in hope. One person's utopia may be another's dystopia and vice versa. And as I say in my classes, one must always ask, utopia for whom? 
dystopia for whom. As we move towards a destination that is never fixed, but constantly negotiated and renegotiated, we find ourselves asking, how do we get from here to there? By what process can we progress? Is it possible for humanity to move along a journey to such an undiscovered country that awaits those who will work toward it? And therein lies at least one vital factor, action, risk, whether personal or corporate or both. I'll speak for myself now. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of not speaking, not acting, not being willing to risk for the benefit of others, to see something of that undiscovered country become real. There are times when I should have acted, should have spoken, should have not been silent, and thus I am complicit with a system of violence allowing injustice to persist. There are other times when I have said or acted in ways that perpetuate such a system, sins of omission and sins of commission for which I bear responsibility. Whether intentional or unconsciously, I contribute to the ongoing dystopia instead of working to discover that new land of which I think I can see a glimpse. Kirk's words, peace is worth a few personal risks, is a noble statement. But have I actually lived this way or have I played it safe, preferring the status quo to the messiness and the struggle to bring about justice, even when it's not to my own benefit or my own security? It would be too easy to remain paralyzed by such a weight, by such guilt, but we cannot remain gripped by our failures. We must do the hard work necessary to effect the change that we long to see, to participate in what is coming and is not yet for a future that is better than our present. Kirk's acknowledgement of his own prejudice, his own arrogance, his own responsibility is a pivotal moment in the film in which he identifies that he must be accountable and that he must change. Spock comes to a similar recognition of his own prejudice. Their mutual confession marks their transformation, their self-awareness of one's own participation in this cycle that must be broken if an alternative future has a chance of becoming reality. The audio clips that we heard at the beginning of our time this morning are warnings of dystopia that can all too easily be created. The lines from the Jedi Master Yoda in the first of the Star Wars prequel films, The Phantom Menace, have become something of an axiom. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Ultimately, Yoda unfortunately predicts actions by Anakin Skywalker, who becomes Darth Vader, turning to the dark side in his quest for power and out of fear that his wife will die in childbirth, adding to the loss that he has experienced from the death of his mother. This fear of a possible future leads him to anger with the Jedi Order, who he blames for holding him back from his potential to be the greatest Jedi ever, and that anger then becomes directed as hatred toward his mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Out of these emotions and dispositions of fear and hatred, Vader is responsible for causing immense suffering across the Star Wars universe in that galaxy far, far away. The other audio clip comes from Doctor Who, Series 8. The exchange is between the 12th Doctor and a Dalek the oldest enemy of the Doctor, from a species whose purpose is to exterminate any life that is not Dalek because it is inferior. By sharing his own memories with this Dalek, the Doctor attempts to convince the Dalek that there is something beautiful and good about life and about the wonder of the universe. Out of this, the Doctor believes that a good Dalek may be possible. At first, this seems to work, as the Dalek starts to experience the wonder and grandeur of life. However, it soon fixates on the Doctor's memories of hatred for the Daleks, which it labels as being good. Now, the Doctor, if you heard the clip, is horrified at this statement, desperately wanting the Dalek to see more than that. But his hatred of the Daleks is so deep and so strong that it seems to define the Doctor in significant ways. The Doctor's own prejudice towards the Daleks, his own hatred, stands in opposition to the person that the doctor explicitly wants to be. The doctor's hatred will only breed more hatred. The doctor will come to understand that he must change, leaving his prejudice and hatred behind him, something that will not be easy, but that is absolutely necessary. 
So turning from science fiction to biblical prophetic literature, I mean, they're the same thing, right? The text from Isaiah 61 is nothing short of utopian, depicting a new world, one radically transformed by the outpouring of God's spirit on the prophet. This individual is to act in accordance with his mission of hope and restoration using language common to the Jubilee celebration in the Torah with the forgiveness of debts and the possibility of a different future for those who have been marginalized and oppressed within Israel's economic system. The prophet is commissioned to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, proclaiming the year of God's favor, bringing judgment, comfort, and rejoicing for those who mourn. These individuals are the righteous who will be planted as oaks, building up the ancient ruins. They will enjoy the wealth of nations and their descendants will be known excuse me, known among the nations. Why? Why will they be known as this? It is because they have followed the mission of proclaiming and acting in accordance with God's message of liberation and hope through both word and deed. They have acted in ways that promote jubilee values, bringing into existence such a vision. Verse 8 from Isaiah 61 states that God loves justice, hating robbery and wrongdoing. God desires justice. So too should God's people. It is significant, of course, that this passage from Isaiah 61 is read by Jesus in his first sermon at the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth in Luke 4. Jesus proclaimed, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The crowd at first, at first, responded positively. They were amazed at the gracious words coming from his mouth. Could it really be true? Would they soon experience this utopian vision as reality? But their affirmation and wonder soon turned into a desire to kill him. Why? Jesus went on to say that this grand vision of the future would include Gentiles, those who were the other, who the, who the people thought should be excluded from God's blessing. Rather, Jesus proclaimed that this Isianic mission was his own mission and that it would reach expansively to include outsiders. Now the crowd wanted to throw him off the cliff. Why? Because this undiscovered country was not just for them. This future would be something much more than that. And they were not willing to live into such an unknown reality and all that it would mean for them to do so. The crowd responded out of fear, anger, hatred, refusing to name and to work beyond their own prejudice. They could not envision this undiscovered country, and they refused to join Jesus' journey to find it. In the midst of our own complicated and chaotic circumstances, we cannot give in to fear. We must resist anger and hatred. We ourselves must name our prejudices and our discomfort with the ministry that calls us to the margins. We must act and speak faithfully in working against injustice, inequality, classism, racism, sexism, gender discrimination, and all forms of bigotry and oppression. We must be honest about ourselves and about how we often get in our own way of seeing this possible future become reality. Peace is worth a few personal risks. We are willing to continue on this long journey that awaits each one of us and all of us collectively. We must be aware that our destination is always in motion. We might be quite surprised who also walks on along that path to a better future, to an undiscovered country, in a new world that is coming, beyond our understanding, but for which we always hope and then set sail, eventually reaching its shores and then setting out again to discover something more. May it be so.
second hymn, number 323, Beyond a Dying Sun. to live out the reality of an undiscovered country, not with fear, not with hatred, but with joy and love and a welcome to all who would be a part of that journey. Amen.